In the year 1972, a young man named Felipe was hired to build a boat for a farmer who also had a store. He arrived at the location and worked tirelessly, day after day, night after night. One night, Felipe and other residents began to hear a strange noise. What could that be? They asked each other. It was an odd sound, as if someone or some animal was rummaging through the ground. Sounds like a pig, one said. Pig, nothing. There aren't any pigs here, another replied. And so they stayed, wondering what or who could be making that noise. Could it be a werewolf? They looked at each other fearfully, starting to believe it might really be one. Another night, when he heard the noise again, Felipe decided to peek slowly through the window, and then he saw, Guys, it's a huge pig. But there are no pigs here, they replied. But what I saw was a huge pig rummaging around back. The next day, they went to check the surroundings and found nothing, no trace of a pig. Didn't I say there were no pigs here? But it was a pig, that's what I saw. Felipe didn't have a shotgun or any other weapon, but he had a harpoon in his toolbox. He went to get it, sharpened it well, and left it ready, determined, I'm going to catch that beast. The next night he set a trap and hid. Around midnight, when the pig started rummaging in the yard, they appeared with sticks, and the pig ran in the direction from where it had entered. That's when Felipe, who was lying in wait, appeared with the harpoon and threw it at the pig's rear. The spear lodged right in the pig's hindquarters, causing it to scream in pain. Surprisingly, the pig stood up, transforming into a creature almost two meters tall and letting out roars that did not sound like a pig at all. The creature, now enraged and wanting revenge, was no longer concerned with those young men. Fortunately, with the injury caused by the spear, the creature couldn't follow them for long, and they managed to escape. The farmer's boat was left unfinished. After seeing that creature, they didn't want to continue the job, but neither the werewolf nor Felipe's harpoon was ever found again. Good night. Hello, my name is Marcelo, and what I am about to relate here happened in the year 2001. The news from my wife, Mariana, brought a mix of joy and anxiety to all of us. Since the beginning of our relationship, we had dreamed of the day we would become parents. It was at this moment of happiness that I received an unexpected lesson from Claudio, a longtime friend and almost a father figure to me, as he was about 30 years older than me. He invited me to spend a weekend at his farm, an invitation that seemed perfect to celebrate the good news we had to commemorate. Mariana and I needed to get away from the city, and the tranquility of the countryside seemed like an ideal refuge. It will be great for you to relax a bit before the baby arrives. Claudio said on the phone. His voice was calm and warm. We left on Friday right after work. The sun was setting on the horizon as I drove along the roads leading to Claudio's farm. The property was in a distant rural area, surrounded by forests and fields. When we arrived, Claudio was waiting for us at the gate, waving with great joy. The farm was truly a paradise. Claudio showed us the land, the ponds, the corral, and the fields of crops that stretched as far as the eye could see. 
it was a place worthy of a postcard. I had been there many years before, but at that time it was much more beautiful than before. However, from the first moment, I noticed something strange in Claudio's behavior. He seemed restless, his eyes constantly scanning the horizon as if waiting for something. Even during moments of relaxation, there was tension in the air. On the second night, while we were sitting on the porch, Claudio suggested something that took us by surprise. How about going to a rural bar for a drink? It's an interesting place and you can meet some of the local residents. Mariana and I looked at each other hesitantly. We didn't know about the existence of a bar nearby, but we decided to accept the suggestion so as not to be party poopers. Claudio took us to his pickup truck and started driving down a dirt road that looked more like an abandoned trail than a public road. The darkness of the night was broken only by the car's headlights, and this was unsettling. After about a few minutes of driving, Claudio stopped the truck in front of what seemed to be something abandoned. Here we are, he said, getting out of the car. Mariana and I got out looking around. The place was deserted, without any sign of life. Claudio, this doesn't look like a bar, I said with a voice full of suspicion. He smiled, but there was something sinister in that smile. We need to walk a bit. The bar is further ahead, hidden among the trees. Suddenly, the silence was broken by a terrifying sound. A long, frightening howl echoed through the forest. Mariana grabbed my arm, her eyes wide with fear. Before we could react, Claudio pushed us to the ground, and then I saw the creature emerging from the trees. It was a huge black creature coming towards us. Claudio immediately moved away, leaving only Mariana and me at the mercy of the beast. Claudio! I shouted, my voice full of desperation and betrayal. What are you doing? He looked at me his face now revealing an expression of guilt mixed with despair. I'm sorry, but I had no choice, he said. The werewolf needs an offering. He will leave my farm in peace if I deliver your wife and your child to him. Horror and indignation took over me. Claudio had brought us there as a sacrifice to save his own skin. The werewolf was advancing more and more, and I knew I needed to act quickly to save the life of my wife and my child. With a protective instinct that had awakened from I don't know where, I picked up a piece of fallen wood from the ground and shouted for Mariana to run. I positioned myself between her and the creature. Mariana ran towards the truck while I faced the creature. There was no possibility of me defeating that creature with a simple piece of wood. I managed to hit the werewolf several times, each blow charged with all the fear and anger I was feeling. Until finally, a stronger blow hit the creature's head, and surprisingly, the beast began to retreat, letting out a howl of pain. I took the opportunity to run to the truck where Mariana was already behind the wheel, ready to leave. She accelerated, and we quickly moved away from the place. We had no idea where Claudio was, and the fact that he hadn't run to the truck made us even more suspicious. Maybe he was watching from a distance, seeing what would happen. We managed to get back to the city safely, still shaken by what we had faced. We went straight to the police to report what had happened. Claudio did not report the theft of the truck, and we left it there at the police station. The story we told began to be investigated, but the police never gave us any information about the man and everything ended up staying as it was. 
Claudio and I never communicated with each other again, and if by chance he is still alive today, he is an old man. Good night. When I was 20 years old, I went fishing with my father at a lake in the forest near our farm. It was a tradition of ours, a way to connect with nature. On that day, something would change our lives forever. We had been fishing for a few hours when something strange happened. The moon shone in the sky and the forest around us suddenly fell silent, as if all the animals had fled. Suddenly. A muffled noise came from the bushes right behind us. My father looked and went to investigate while I stayed at my fishing spot. Suddenly I started to hear my father's screams and sounds of a struggle. My heart raced because my father was in danger. I ran towards him and when I arrived I saw a huge creature dragging my father into the forest. His eyes were full of terror and pain and he screamed my name before disappearing into the darkness. I was paralyzed, unable to move or scream. That image was etched in my mind. The authorities never found my father. They conducted extensive searches but there was no trace of him. Eventually, he was declared missing. No one believed me when I told them about the werewolf. I was considered by my family and acquaintances as a traumatized and confused young man, but I knew what I had seen. For about ten years, that certainty burned inside me, turning into a desire for revenge and justice. Today, at 31 years old, I am determined to find and destroy the creature that took my father. My younger brother Marcos believed me. He was 13 years old at the time but he always trusted my account. Together we planned an expedition to hunt that creature. We were armed with rifles, knives, and traps ready for anything. One night while we were in the forest hunting the creature in the same place where my father had disappeared, a man appeared. He was a local farmer, also with a shotgun and a stern look. You shouldn't be here, he said. If you stay, you'll die. We tried to explain our mission, but he shook his head and said, I've seen that creature too. It's impossible to kill it or prove its existence. You're making a mistake and I assure you that your father wouldn't want you to have the same fate as him. The farmer took us to his house, a very rustic house that had belonged to his grandparents, full of tools and hunting trophies. There he told us his story. He said he had seen the creature many years ago, but it always managed to escape. He explained that the thing was smarter than any animal he had ever hunted. As we listened, strange sounds began to surround the house, scratching of claws and low growls, the kind of sound that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Mr. Carlos stood up and grabbed his shotgun. Stay inside the house. I'm going outside. If I don't come back, lock yourselves in that room. He pointed to one of the bedrooms with a metal door. We watched him leave, and the door closed behind him. The following minutes were agonizing. We heard sounds of a struggle and then a horrible scream. We ran to the window and saw the creature, the same one that had taken my father. Gunshots echoed through the forest, but even with dawn approaching, the farmer did not return. Like my father, he was also declared missing. The creature had taken another victim. Marcos and I didn't want to give up. I needed to avenge my father's death and now also felt obligated to avenge the death of that farmer. We set traps around the camp and were ready to face the creature the next night. Every noise and every shadow were signs. About a month after the farmer's disappearance, we were at the camp and every noise and shadow seemed to announce that the creature would appear. 
we started to hear heavy footsteps and fierce growls. The creature was back. This time, we wouldn't run away. When the creature approached the house, we turned on the spotlights we had prepared, temporarily blinding it, and began firing our rifles. We hit the creature several times but it seemed immune and started to charge at us. Marcos and I reloaded our rifles and grabbed our machetes, attacking the creature until we made it fall into one of our traps. We managed to trap it in an iron cage. It roared and struggled but the trap held firm. That's when we noticed something strange. Its eyes, which were bestial, seemed to want to become human eyes. For a moment I hesitated. The creature began to transform rapidly. Now it was a man, and with a hoarse and desperate voice he said, Help me. When the transformation ended I couldn't believe it. It was my father. The truth was more terrifying than I could have imagined. The creature hadn't killed my father, but had turned him into a creature like itself. My father asked me to kill him, but I could never do that. He said he couldn't go back to our family because he was a threat to us. Without telling what happened on that night about ten years ago, I released him, and he ran off into the forest. The creature never appeared again and my father, what I have no idea where he is or if he is alive or dead. Good night. Ever since I inherited my grandfather's farm, life has always been simple and predictable. I had the life I always prayed for, taking care of animals and crops. However, everything changed when some of my animals began to disappear. At first I thought they were simply wild animals roaming around my property. But as more and more animals vanished without a trace, I realized it could be something more sinister, and I decided to take drastic measures. Armed with my rural experience, I set traps around the farm. Every night was a lonely vigil, listening carefully for any suspicious movement in the dead of night. And it was on one of those nights that a scream echoed through the darkness. I didn't hesitate. I grabbed my gun and flashlight and ran toward the sound. My heart pounded in my chest, and there, among the twisted trees, I found the source of the scream. A creature that defied all logic and reason. It was trapped in one of my traps. Its claws were sharp, its eyes conveyed an unusual rage. It was like nothing I had ever seen before in my life. Its skin was dark, with irregular teeth, and it emitted a smell of decay. But what scared me the most was the hatred in its eyes. It began to growl when it saw me, trying to free itself to attack me. I've never been one to be paralyzed by fear, and with quick, precise movements, I aimed my gun at the beast until it finally stopped moving. With my heart racing, I dragged the creature's body away from the farm. The river was waiting for it. If the thing hadn't died, it would die now in the depths of the river, unable to breathe. The next morning the farm was calm. The animals seemed more at ease, and as the nights passed, the disappearances ceased. Life returned to normal. I have no idea what that creature was, where it came from, or why it looked at me with such hatred. These questions remain unanswered, buried in the depths of the river along with the bones of that creature, which must still be in those depths. 
Good night. My name is Juliao, and my friend Carlos and I are experienced hunters accustomed to these wild nights. In the year 2002, we went on a hunt that would change our lives forever. Our target was a large wild boar that I and other hunters wanted to kill, because this big boar was causing significant damage to local crops. Carlos and I were determined to put an end to that destruction. Equipped with our rifles and sharp machetes, powerful lanterns, we set out on our quest, accompanied by our faithful companions Max and Rex. Both were trained with years of experience in the art of sniffing and tracking their prey. The dog's eyes gleamed with excitement for the hunt, and their barks echoed through the woods, announcing our presence that night. As we advanced along the dark trails, the forest's silence transformed into nocturnal noises. But among these sounds, there was one that guided us, the persistent barking of our dogs indicating we were on the right track. After hours of tireless searching, we finally found the boar's trail. Its deep footprints in the earth indicated it wasn't far from us. We kept moving forward, and finally, we spotted our prey. It stood in a clearing, rooting around what seemed to be an armadillo hole. With determined looks, Carlos and I prepared for the attack. Our rifles were aimed, and with a discreet signal, we fired at the creature. Even wounded, the boar charged at us. The dogs barked and lunged at him, and after a few more shots, he finally fell. He let out a few gasping grunts and covered in sweat, Carlos and I looked at our conquest with a mix of triumph and relief. The hunt had come to an end. We were also prepared to capture that moment. First, it was Carlos's turn, who positioned himself next to the slain boar with the dogs around. I was ready to take the photo, and then it would be my turn. But as I was about to click, Something strange happened. Our dogs, now quiet after the boar was killed, started barking furiously. Their fur bristled. Something was wrong. Something was approaching. It was then that even with the dog's agitation, we noticed something coming through the foliage. It was a large, imposing creature. When Carlos and I aimed our flashlights in its direction, we realized it was a werewolf. Fear took over us as we prepared to confront that threat. With our weapons in hand and our dogs by our side, we were ready for the showdown. The werewolf growled. One thing was certain. It wanted to kill us. In a single moment, the forest silence was shattered by the sound of gunshots and growls. The dogs Max and Rex defended us bravely, facing the werewolf even though the creature was much larger than them. After several shots and a struggle among all of us, the creature finally retreated into the forest darkness. It was wounded but managed to escape. We had to get out of there as quickly as possible before that thing returned. We decided to hunt again, 
leaving the boar behind and started running back. The next day in the sunlight we returned to that spot with other hunters, all armed, although we knew that if it was indeed a werewolf, according to legend, it wouldn't appear during the day when we reached that point again. The boar was gone. There was only one explanation. The creature had returned there, didn't find us, so it took the boar to not leave empty-handed. Where to, we never found out. Good night. My name is Noara. What I'm about to recount here happened in the year 2008. I was returning from college in a city where I studied, which was about 15 kilometers from my small town. It was around 11.30 at night when my car broke down on the deserted road. I was alone, lost in the darkness with only the moonlight to guide me. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to start the car again, but it was useless. I couldn't stay there. Before the car completely stopped, I had pulled over right on the edge of the road, where it couldn't cause accidents. I grabbed my bag and got out of the car, feeling the cold of that night. I had no choice but to continue on foot along the road since there was no cell signal there and I couldn't ask for help. I started walking and after about two kilometers I saw the lights of a pickup truck approaching in the darkness. My heart skipped a beat, a mixture of relief and apprehension filling my chest. The vehicle slowed down until it stopped next to me. It was an older man, elderly, with deep wrinkles and tired eyes. He smiled at me through the window, his voice rough and reassuring. Do you need a ride, miss? I hesitated for a moment. My instinct for self-preservation warned me of the danger of accepting a ride from a stranger in the middle of the night, but then I looked at the dark road ahead of me and thought about the possibility of continuing on foot, alone and vulnerable. Fear pushed me towards the pickup truck. Yes, please, I replied. I got into the vehicle anyway, letting myself be carried away by the temporary relief of the situation. The man introduced himself as Osmar a local farmer who was returning to his farm after a trip to the city. He said that before returning to the farm, he would take me to the town, which was now about eight or nine kilometers away. However, as we drove away, I already knew what he was after. My heart sank in my chest. I was naive enough not to realize his intentions, but I was determined not to give in not to allow him to take away my dignity and my safety. When we finally arrived at his farm, he tried to seduce me with sweet words and empty promises. I stood firm, refusing his advances with silent determination. He, with anger, seemed like the rage he was feeling was causing something to happen in his body, and he began to contort in front of my eyes. His face started to become a wild face, fur began to grow, a frightening shape began to appear there. I had no doubts that man was transforming into a werewolf. I started screaming as I jumped out of the vehicle, running through the darkness of the farm, while that beast finished transforming, letting out horrifying roars. The thing got out of the pickup truck, 
started sniffing the air and searching for me. I only had one chance to wait for that beast to move away from the truck and hope the key was in the ignition. The thing began to move away, searching for me, and when I had the chance I ran and jumped into the vehicle. My hands were trembling as I turned the key in the ignition, but by the grace of God the key was there. The engine started and I pressed the accelerator with all the force I had, leaving the farm and the werewolf behind. I drove so fast that the dust the pickup truck was kicking up prevented me from seeing if the werewolf was behind me. I managed to get back to the asphalt and make it to the city. I didn't even want to know what could happen in a situation like that. I went straight to the police, explained everything that had happened, and that I was going there to leave that man's pickup truck. I left all my information in case it was needed. The police, seeing my desperation, even tried to believe my story. But when they managed to contact the farmer, he was no longer in his werewolf form and, according to the police, did not want to file any complaint regarding the theft of his pickup truck. He told the police that I was just scared of him. From that night on, I started going to college by van, and even though I was in a van with many other people, whenever I passed that point on the road, I was afraid. Good night. Hello, my name is Alavo. I'm a farmer in an undisclosed region. On a certain night in the year 1992, I was doing some work in the corral near the farm's headquarters. That's when I heard a sinister howl echoing through the darkness. <coughs> raced when I realized I wasn't alone. I looked around, but saw nothing but the trees swaying in the wind. Suddenly, something began to move in the nearby bushes. A tremor ran through my body until I began to see bright eyes and fangs ready to attack me. It was a werewolf, a fierce and deadly creature. Before I could react, the beast attacked leaving me wounded and bloody, but with God's grace, I survived. The beast went away without giving me a final blow. Determined to protect my farm and myself, I decided to take some measures the next day. As soon as I recovered from the injuries, I filled the entire property with bright lights. Every nook and cranny flooded with intense luminosity. I thought the light would drive away that beast and that it would never dare to venture near my farm again. For a few weeks, my plan seemed to work as I continued to live without that thing coming back. But fear still haunted me. Then, about two months later, that howl echoed again, breaking the silence of the illuminated farm. My heart sank when I saw that sinister figure emerging from the shadows. The werewolf was back, defying the light and my determination. Trembling with fear, I decided to confront the werewolf, the worst terror that haunted me. I shot several times at that beast and, finally, after about three shots in its chest, the thing fell to the ground. I thought it was dead 
but about two minutes later, it began to rise again and, without looking at me, started limping back into the forest. It was so bizarre that I didn't even dare to shoot at the beast again. After all, last time, it also let me leave alive. To this day, my farm remains illuminated everywhere, but that beast never returned. Good night. In the peaceful village of Val de Sombras, surrounded by dense forests and vast fields, lived a fearless farmer named Pedro. Over the years, the residents of the region began to speak of strange nightly attacks plaguing the village. Many believed that a werewolf was on the loose, causing fear and apprehension among the inhabitants. Pedro known for his courage and skill as a hunter, decided to confront the threat head-on. One night, he set up an ambush on the outskirts of the village, patiently waiting for the creature that lurked in the shadows of the full moon. The atmosphere was tense, and the wind whispered dark stories among the trees. Finally, the moment arrived Pedro heard a long, chilling howl echoing through the forest. He moved silently among the trees, holding firmly onto a thick rope he had prepared to capture the beast. The werewolf appeared, its yellow eyes shining in the darkness, and Pedro, with unwavering courage, threw the rope over the creature. The werewolf, surprised, was pulled forward, Struggling against the restraints, Pedro, determined to protect his village, began to drag the beast towards the farm, where he intended to show the residents that the danger had been neutralized. The journey was arduous, and the beast, despite being bound, did not give in easily. The sound of its claws scraping on the ground echoed in the night and its growls reverberated through the forest. Pedro, sweating and exhausted, remained focused on his goal. When the farm was finally in sight, the atmosphere changed. The werewolf, realizing that its fate was revealed, intensified its efforts to break free. The rope began to give way, and the creature writhed violently freeing itself with a fierce roar. Pedro, surprised by the strength of the animal, barely had time to react. The beast, now free, charged towards him. By a hair's breadth, Pedro escaped the sharp claws of the werewolf, rolling on the ground. The farmer, quickly getting up, saw the creature swiftly retreat, into the darkness of the forest. The village, upon learning of Pedro's bold attempt, was divided between admiration for his courage and renewed fear of the mysterious threat. The story of the farmer's courageous confrontation became a local legend, but the mystery of the werewolf persisted, looming over veiled sombras like an inescapable shadow. Despite failing to bring the beast to justice, Pedro remained a symbol of bravery in the struggle against the unknown.
Hello, I'm Geraldo, a 68-year-old man. Presently divorced, I have two grown children. The story I'm about to share dates back to 1980s when I was still single. Back then, I was exclusively dating my future wife, with whom I am now divorced. Both of us hailed from farming backgrounds. I lived on my parents' farm, and she resided on her parents' farm. My uncle, known as Z. Pedro, also a farmer, owned a farm near my future father-in-law's property. The distance between our farms was eight kilometers of dirt road. During this period, I was 28 years old, and my cousins, who were around my age, were the children of Uncle Z. Pedro. Frequently, I visited my uncle's farm, where he and my cousins would spend time enjoying drinks and raising free-range chickens. Most often, I would stop by when heading to my future father-in-law's farm to visit my girlfriend. On weekends, I owned a car named Joe. On Fridays, I would head to Uncle Z. Pedro's farm to share some drinks with my cousins before proceeding to my girlfriend's father's farm. We had a routine planned, and I had communicated with my girlfriend the previous weekend, confirming that I would spend the following weekend with Uncle Z. Pedro. One Friday, however, I lost track of time due to lively conversations and excessive consumption of cacha, a Brazilian spirit, Unaware of the passing time, I was supposed to arrive at my father-in-law's farm by the afternoon. Concerned about my delay, my girlfriend, whose name I won't mention here, prompted my 16-year-old brother-in-law to ride his bike to Uncle Z. Pedro's farm and asked me to hurry up. My brother-in-law pedaled those eight kilometers on his bike in vain. I was so intoxicated that, despite assuring him I would leave soon, I lingered. Time slipped away unnoticed and by the time I realized it was well past midnight, an absurd hour to arrive at my father-in-law's house. However, in my inebriated state, I was indifferent. Eventually bidding farewell to my cousins and uncles, I ventured onto the road, approximately 20 to 30 minutes from reaching my destination, my car abruptly stalled after covering about two kilometers. Despite my attempts to troubleshoot, being no mechanic, I couldn't identify the issue. Frustrated and in the darkness, I decided to leave the car by the roadside my only recourse was to walk back to Uncle Z. Pedro's farm, about two kilometers away, seeking help from my cousins to tow the car. By some stroke of luck, I reached Uncle Z. Pedro's farm without incident. On arrival, my uncles were already asleep, leaving only my cousins and some friends in a makeshift kiosk behind the house, still engaged in drinking, I recounted the mishap, and swiftly, my cousins procured a thick rope. Using Uncle Z. Pedro's truck, two cousins and a friend joined me to retrieve my car. When we reached the stranded vehicle, we turned it in the opposite direction for the return journey to the farm. With the rope securely fastened, the truck led, my cousin and their friend inside it, while another cousin accompanied me in my car. We proceeded cautiously to prevent the rope from loosening. After covering around 800 meters, the unforeseen occurred. Out of nowhere, a massive creature emerged from the bushes, crossing the road between the truck and my car, nearly causing a mishap. I awoke abruptly and that entity glared malevolently from one side to the other, eyeing both the truck and my car with immense hostility etched on its face. 
It seemed irritated by the presence of the vehicles and the rope on the road. My cousin, who accompanied me, started screaming. Both of us were defenseless, and I assumed the other two in the truck shared our vulnerability. In a moment of panic, I began flashing the headlights at the truck. My cousin, who was driving, observed the creature in the rearview mirror and accelerated. The truck surged forward, and for a moment, I feared the worst, that it might awaken and release itself from my cousin's grip, leaving us alone with that creature and a broken down car. Thankfully, the rope held firm. My car, a large vehicle with robust Ford bracelet bodywork from that era, absorbed a substantial impact when the creature, wielding a plastic object, struck its right side. In the chaos, my cousin, in an attempt to shield himself, inadvertently ended up lying on top of me, fearing an attack through the window as the creature passed by our side. My cousin skillfully navigated the truck, almost toppling it at times, especially when encountering certain holes in the road. Eventually, we neared the farm, approximately 500 meters away. The tension escalated until, thankfully, the rope finally came loose. My cousin promptly halted the truck, and we all exited the vehicles. Realizing we were safely outside the car, my cousin uttered a relieved thank you as we hastily retreated. My other cousin and I hurriedly boarded the truck and we returned to the farm, leaving the car stranded once again along that eerie road. This time, however, we were much closer to the safety of the farm. That bizarre encounter was not with any ordinary creature. It unfolded in a matter of seconds, prompting us to swiftly lock up. Inside the house, fear gripped us, each of us armed with a machete, even though we were within the supposed safety of our home. It must have been around 1.30 or o'clock in the morning. We maintained complete silence, avoiding waking up Uncle Z. Pedro. Instead, we huddled in a room, clutching our machetes until dawn. As daylight broke, armed not only with machetes but also shotguns from my uncle's collection on the farm, we cautiously returned to the spot where my car had been stranded. In the daytime, our fear intensified and we meticulously scanned our surroundings. Upon reaching the scene, I assessed the aftermath of the creature encounter. Thankfully, the damage was limited to a cracked headlight, and the bodywork remained unscathed. I promptly called for the car to be towed back to the farm, and by around 7 o'clock in the morning, the task was completed. By this time, I had sobered up from the previous night's drinking and was preoccupied with concerns about my girlfriend and in-laws, contemplating what they might be thinking of me. I requested my cousin to drive me to their place so I could explain the situation. During the journey, I decided not to mention the bizarre creature or the eerie encounter, fearing they might doubt the authenticity of my story. I thought it best not to provoke skepticism. Upon arrival, I explained everything, but unfortunately, my girlfriend was furious. She refused to speak to me, suspecting that my account of the car incident was fabricated. Despite my attempts to clarify, tensions lingered. Disheartened, I returned with my cousin to the farm to address the car problem. We sought out a local mechanic, but to our dismay, he was unavailable. He had gone fishing, and his wife informed us that he wouldn't be back until Sunday night. 
The earliest he could inspect my car would be Monday morning. After careful consideration, I decided to stay on Uncle Z. Pedro's farm until Monday, planning to accompany the mechanic to assess the situation. Despite the circumstances, it was still Saturday, and once again my cousins and I chose to drown our troubles with a drinking session that commenced around 3 in the afternoon. Continuing until approximately 8 o'clock in the evening, as the evening unfolded, we once again found ourselves immersed in intoxication. Little did we know that this inebriation would later embolden us to embark on a preposterous venture. Around 11 p.m., fueled by liquid courage, we collectively decided to venture into the woods to hunt down the mysterious creature. Not everyone was on board with this impulsive plan, myself included. Having seen the creature up close and understanding its terrifying nature, I was hesitant. Inebriation, however, clouded my judgment, and I also entertained the thought that locating the creature again might be a stroke of luck or misfortune, as it were. Around midnight, Nearly one o'clock in the morning, the group reconvened inside the truck at the exact spot on the road where we had encountered the creature the night before. Soon, we parked the truck, armed ourselves with machetes and shotguns, and plunged into the woods. Despite the heightened tension compared to the previous night, Laughter permeated the air as we navigated through the unfamiliar terrain. As anticipated, our search yielded nothing, and the initial bravado began to wane. Suddenly, we heard someone calling out. It was the voice of my uncle Z. Pedro. The sound emanated from the road, leaving us perplexed and frightened as we hadn't anticipated his presence. Unbeknownst to us, he had ventured out without our knowledge, assuming we were under attack. In a panic, we sprinted towards his voice. Upon reaching the road where the truck was parked, Uncle Z. Pedro stood there, shotgun in hand. Fuming with anger, he admonished us, cursing and vehemently discouraging our pursuit of the creature. He emphasized the potential consequences, cautioning that bullets might not be enough if we persisted in our ill-conceived hunt. Armed with shotguns intended to subdue the formidable beast, the realization dawned upon us that being on foot this time might not yield the same fortune as the previous night. The creature, undoubtedly, had the potential to inflict harm, perhaps claiming one of us before the others could intervene. Unwilling to risk such a gruesome scenario, we unanimously retreated to the safety of the truck, including my uncle, and headed back to the farm. Upon our return, I questioned my uncle about his certainty that bullets wouldn't suffice against the creature in a serious tone, he began recounting his own encounters with similar beasts from his youth. Despite numerous attempts to neutralize the creature, it seemed impervious to harm, refusing to succumb to gunfire. For the next two hours we listened intently as my uncle shared captivating stories on the subject. The tales unfolded like scenes from a gripping movie, resonating deeply with us, given the eerily similar situation we had faced the night before. Gratitude filled me as I acknowledged my uncle's wisdom in steering us away from a potential encounter in the woods. Regrettably, some time has passed since my uncle Z. Pedro departed from this world. Nevertheless, his memory remains etched in my heart, 
and I will forever cherish the role he played in shaping a significant part of my youth. Good night.